Good evening from the kitchen folks for what is yet another experimental day in home brewing. Today I'm going to attempt to make a summer citrus lager. So here's my key ingredients. Well I'm using lager from a kit, a Cooper's lager kit. I've never used one in my entire life. I've only ever done one kit so far and it wasn't lager. I've got no idea what to expect, but I didn't want to leave it as boring lager because you know what? I'm not that keen on boring lager. So to pump it up, I'll be adding bits of the skin and juice from two grapefruit, a bottle of Robinson's lemon barley water, the skin and uh, juice from four limes. I've got medium spray malt. Now I wanted light spray malt, but I couldn't find any. So I've gone for medium, which might give it a slightly more bitter flavor than what I'd wanted, but hopefully to counterbalance that, I'm gonna add a little bit of rose syrup, which is extremely sweet. To pump that ABV further up, I've got a kilogram of brewing sugar, dextrous monohydrate. I'm gonna be feeding my yeast with yeast nutrient. I'm gonna be hopefully getting a clear product by adding a bit of pectolase. I've got spring water, 24 litres of which just there because the tap water in Leeds is a bit chlorine-y. And my fermentation vessel of choice today, which is currently upside down, is Big Betty, my flat bottom firmzilla. So let's crack on. So the top of the Cooper's kit just comes off and reveals a sachet of yeast. All right, crikey, that's some strong glue. Right. So this is brewing yeast, seven grams of which Cooper's brewing. Nothing else on there to suggest what sort of uh, a yeast it is. I'm going to stick with this yeast that's come with it and not add anything different. You've got to love the Aussies for their simplicity of instructions. It comes with four instructions on the side of the tin here. Number one, mix. Number two, brew. Number three, bottle. Number four, enjoy. So I'm going to begin by adding my spring water into my big pan. And I'm not going to add all of it. I'm going to put eight litres of it in here to begin with. You can hear how deep it is. Sounds like it's going down the well. And all plastic is recycled. So this is my final two litres of the eight going in right now. So it's a 15 litre cooking pot and it's now just over half full. Let's not leave that water on its own. I'm going to add my lemon barley water to this. Now there's a reason I'm doing this. The lemon barley water contains preservatives which are potassium sorbate and sodium metabisulfate. And some people will go, oh, unclean, keep it away from my brew. Some people will say, shove it in your brew, it's not a problem. And some people will say, boil it first, then shove it in your brew. Do you know what? I've done it always, really. I used to avoid it completely. Then I started to just put it in and then I started to boil it and put it in and you know what, it works. I want that nice lemoniness and barley water's lovely. I use it in turbo ciders so it will work just as well in here but I am going to boil this water so hopefully that will nullify any damaging effects that the stabilizers uh, preservatives can have. The key issue with the preservatives is that it slows down the development of the yeast and the fermentation, but ultimately the yeast recovers every time so far for me anyway. And I now need to get rid of a bit of plastic. So I've got my barley water in the pot. Next, I'm gonna add my fruit. So I've got my fruit in a colander in the sink. This is just in case there's any waxiness on them. I'm gonna wash them with very hot water and just give them a little swish around just in case there is any waxiness, so I would like that to come off. I don't think there is any on there, I'm just being safe rather than sorry. So while they're draining off, I'm going to put some heat on this pan. Now I'm going to turn that down a bit, I don't want it roaring. I'll turn it down to a moderately medium to low flame. So I'm just sharpening my little fruit knife and I'm doing this because I want it to be really sharp so I just get the edge of the skin off. What I don't want is the pith 
underneath the skin because that's bitter and I don't want it to give my lager a bitter summer fruits taste. I want it to have a nice citrusy fruity taste. The skin and the oils in the skin along with the juice from the fruit will do just that. Okay I'm going to begin by demonstrating on the grapefruit what I want. I just want the edges of the skin like this and to leave the white of the zest underneath it. It doesn't matter if I get a little bit of the zest but what I don't want to find is that I've got a lot of it and I'm going to remove all the skin from the grapefruit before I go into the next step. So I'll come back to you when I've skinned this one. So that's one skinned grapefruit. I'm going to take the skin and I'm going to drop it in here and in essence make a tea. As far as the grapefruit goes I now need to half this. Thinking of that Markham and Wise sketch. Right, I've got my juicer, got my grapefruit. It's as easy as this now. Just push and turn and push and turn and all that juice will become extracted from the grapefruit. I'll leave the pith behind but I'll get lots of lovely juice out of it. And this will capture the grapefruit seeds in the top so I won't get them in my brew either. So now it's like that Morecambe and Wise sketch. All done. So one grapefruit gives me that much juice which is quite nice. I'm going to add the grapefruit juice into the brew. And then I've got the other grapefruit and the limes to do next. So it's going to take me a little bit of time. You don't need to see me doing that. I'll come back to you when it's done. So that's all my grapefruit and lime skins and juice in the pan. The carcasses will go to compost. So all that fruit matter in there can cause cloudiness in the final brew. So I'm going to add a couple of generous dessert spoonfuls of pectolase into there. Just spread it around, let it dissolve. There we go. I do this with wine and cider all the time. I mentioned that I had some rose syrup. It's extremely sweet, a bit Turkish delight flavoury, but I think it will counterbalance the bitterness of the spray malt. It's only about that much in the bottom of the bottle, but it will add a nice bit of flavour anyway. So I'm just going to pour this in too. It's a right brew, isn't it? Everything but the kitchen sink. I'm now going to add my kilogram of brewing sugar into the mix. This dissolves really easily. It leaves a cleaner taste than standard household caster sugar. The yeast finds it easier to break down. There will be some people that say, oh that's a load of rubbish, but trust me I've done it both ways and I know. So I'm just going to give this all a lovely big stir now. It smells wonderful. The lime particularly uh, is very noticeable. Right, let's get into this Cooper's Lager Kit. Let's see what we've got. I think every single tin opener I've ever owned has been rubbish. This was a recommendation from somebody the last time I was opening a tin on camera. And look at it, rubbish. Oh, now it's doing something. Oh, there we go. Oh, I can smell that malt. So this is the gloopy goo that's in there. And unfortunately, those speckles on the top, I think are bits of tin that have come off from the tin opener. I am going to try and do something about that. I could be wrong, but I suspect that's what it is. You don't want that in your drink, do you? I want to blame the tin opener. Anyway, I think I've got all of that out of there. So now it's time to tip the treacle or the lager extract. Oh, look at that go. Oh, beautiful. I started off, my first beers that I ever made were actually grain beers and I'm a relative newcomer to um, the old uh, kits. I'm still a novice when it comes to grain. But this looks and smells wonderful. Look at the pattern. Oh, 
I was trying to draw a knob, couldn't do it. Nearly. I've got just about everything I can out of there, but just to get those bits around the edge, I'm going to boil some water in the kettle and pour that in. I can't feel anything stuck to the bottom, so I think this has dissolved really quickly. The water feels very buoyant, or I should say wart, as it is now. Okay. There. Now I can pour this in. Safety first though, oven gloves. Now it's time to add my spray malt. Let the spray malt meet the wart. In we go. It can be a bit uh, lumpy and crusty to start with, but I'll work that out a bit. I don't know why, but I always feel like I'm a drugs manufacturer when I'm brewing. Right, so I'm going to move this around. I want that spray malt to break up. Whoa, this is so, so buoyant. Now I want this to come to a simmer. I'm getting there. Right, I think we're there. Oh, we're there. Right. Heat off. And that's that. I shall pop the lid back on and I'm now going to leave that. So to point out, my liquid is extremely hot and my fermentation vessel is made of plastic. Therefore I'm going to leave this overnight and pick it up in the morning so I'll catch you then for part two. See you then folks. Hey folks, it's the next day, it's time to get on with the beer. Let's have a look at it. So it's still in the pan and let me tell you this pan has been here for 14 hours and it's still warm. It's much warmer than body temperature. There's the wort. I've got the fermenter ready and despite the lovely sunshine outside it's really cold. It's about six degrees and uh, so this is probably going to be a good temperature in my utility room out there. For fermenting this because this needs to ferment between 10 and 15 degrees. So I'm stood in bright sunshine so I'm sorry if I've got shadows across part of me and the uh, visuals aren't amazing. Might even be better if the shadows across my face but what I've got to do right now is to put eight litres of cold spring water into the fermenter. That's going to protect it from the warm liquid that comes in which isn't hot by any means but it's definitely warm and I don't want to do any damage to my lovely flat bottom firm Zilla. If you haven't got one of these it's brilliant. It's way better than a bucket because you can see what's going on inside it and I like that. So just while I'm pouring this one in I need to ask you have you subscribed to my YouTube page yet? If you haven't please do mosshomeandgarden.co.uk hit the red subscribe button and the little bell and you'll get notifications of new uploads. All my films virtually these days are about brewing but I also do some cooking and gardening stuff as well. Whilst I'm pimping my social media I've also got a Moss Home and Garden Facebook page and if you want to follow me on Insta I'm at Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S Give us a follow, send me a message, tell me where you saw this and I'll follow you back. And I can't say fairer than that. Right, getting litres 7 and 8 in. And then we'll start to add the beer wort. I'm just going to recycle my plastic bottles. I'll be back shortly. Right, I've got my beer wort in the sink. And I'm going to transfer it into the Firmzilla with a plastic jug which I've sanitised. And as I'm doing this, I need to tell you that the smell of this is wonderful. It's really malty, but the citrus is just so obvious. I've got high hopes for a really nice fruity flavoured lager. I hope so. Can you imagine that scenario? Really hot sunny day in the garden. We do get them in Leeds now and again. In summertime, kicking back, 
with a really nice bottle of lager, which is something that you've made yourself, or I've made myself. All the nice fruit flavours in there. I think that sounds pretty good to me. I'm not really normally a lager drinker, but I think there's something to be said for making it yourself and pimping it your own way, you know. Anyway, this is quite a long job. I'll come back to you when it's done. I've got to that dangerous last bit which could go anywhere, so I thought it might provide some dramatic suspense and action for the film. Here we go. Oh, it seems to be behaving itself. Please note that all of the skins from the fruit and all that stuff's going in as well. And it's going to stay in there throughout the fermentation in primary, but when I rack to secondary, I'll filter that out. There we go. I don't want to waste out. Right, I'm going to put another two litres of spring water into this, and I think I'll be about done then. Oops, I'm trying not to get it everywhere. Done. So you'll note that I'm on the 25 litre mark exactly and precisely. I'm more than happy with that. There's plenty of room on this. This is another reason I like this vessel for the Krausen. You know, Krausens can build very tall, but because this is so wide, it tends to spread itself out nicely. And I haven't yet, fingers crossed, had an eruption out of this. Watch this one be my first now, I've said that. Okay, I want to take the original gravity of this so at the end of the brew I can work out the alcohol by volume, but this is still too warm. It's definitely above 20, so I'm going to ladle some out into this and put this in the fridge. And then I'll take the gravity from that when it's dropped to 20, and I'll crack on with the brew in the meantime. What I put in here, I'm not going to put back in there, just in case of any cross-contamination. It's only a 100ml sacrifice. So I shall put this sieve on top to keep any airborne contaminants out. And I'm just going to take the temperature of this right now. So the room temperature in this room where I currently am, where the sun's shining, it is quite warm and we've had the cooker on, is 18. The temperature of the wort is 23.2. So it's not got a long way to go to cool down. So I'm just going to pop this in the fridge. So cracking on with the brew, I'm going to put two very generous dessert spoonfuls of yeast nutrient in here, heaped ones at that. Oop, splash. Do you know what, let's just give it a little bit more for good luck. I want that yeast to be happy. Next I'm going to put the yeast in. So this is the yeast which came with the pack. It just says brewing yeast. It doesn't give you any more instructions as to what kind of yeast it is. I'm guessing it's a standard lager yeast. I did consider putting a Kolsch yeast in instead. But I'm going to go with what came with the pack. So I'm just going to sprinkle this on top. It's a seven gram packet and I'm going to put the whole packet in. I'm just going to agitate this slightly. I'd like the yeast to sink if possible, but what I don't want to do is agitate it to the point that the yeast all sticks around the edges. Okay, I've got the yeast in place, now I'm going to put the firmzilla together so the top goes on and it pushes down and I need to make sure that it's down evenly on all sides and then there is a lock which spins into place. Now I've just had a little brainwave while I'm doing this. This needs to ferment at a cool temperature, say 10 to 15 degrees. The utility room, 20 hours of the day, is probably between 10 and 15 degrees, but for four hours of the day, the heating comes on and it gets incredibly warm in there. So I've now thought maybe it's worth fermenting this in my office, which is basically a converted garage. It's cold in there on the floor, and if I don't have the heating on in there, which I quite often don't, it's very cold in there. So I think I'm going to ferment it on my office floor instead. Okay, I'm waiting for my wort to cool before I can take the gravity. Quick shower, back in a bit. Right, I'm back, showered, feeling incredible. Okay, finally got the temperature to 20, so in goes the hydrometer. 
and that has settled at 1.048 1048. So I've got the Firmzilla labelled up. It's now time to get this moved into my office. Welcome to the office. So here it is. This is where it will stay now for the next two weeks at least. And then after that time, uh, we'll have a little update. So I'll give you an update when fermentation has begun and I've got the Krausen and I can see some uh, bubbles coming through. But until then, I'll catch you later, folks. So just a next day update. You can see that we have a, a, a nice small Krausen on the top there, but a definite Krausen, so something's going on. The bubble activity in the airlock isn't huge, but I'm expecting this to pick up a little bit in the next 24 hours. So I'll give another update in about 24 hours time. Hey folks, it's now 24 hours since I put the beer in my office. Let's have a look at it. And as you can see, the Krausen has definitely risen. It's looking quite good actually. And I'm getting a steady stream of bubbles coming through here. There you can see it's looking uh, like the CO2 is being produced. Temperature wise, it's absolutely freezing in here. So I'm just looking at my uh, thermometer. It says that the temperature in the room at the minute is 14.1 degree. It's not been above 15 in here today. But this is an ideal temperature for lager. But anyway, fermenting it is. And unless anything dramatic happens, the next film that you see from me will be when I rack this from the large vessel into Demijohns, probably in two weeks' time or so. OK, catch you then, folks. Just an impromptu update. Nothing hugely dramatic, but this is now five days in, and look how that is flying through the airlock. It's developed a really nice Krausen, as you can see. Not too high, nice and spread out. But yeah, really fermenting very strongly, so it's going really well. And the temperature in this room is currently 12 degrees. It definitely hasn't risen above 15. So a day seven update. And you saw how fast fermentation was on day five. Well, two days later, it slowed right down. Let's look at the Krausen. The Krausen has gone very thin. In some places it's not there at all. And what we can now see are the fruit skins floating on top of the beer. So I suspect that this won't be too much longer before fermentation is over and I might be racking to secondary before two weeks. Good morning from the kitchen folks. Today it's my citrus lager racking day. Let's have a look at it. So here it is. It's been in the primary fermenting vessel for nine days only and fermentation has all but ceased. I'm getting a bubble through the airlock about every 80 to 90 seconds. So to me it's not worth leaving it in there. I want to get it into Demijohns now and monitor it uh, more closely. Now the other reason I want to take it out of here is I don't want to leave the fruit skins in there for any longer uh, because I don't want them to put any bad flavours into this. So I'm going to be racking into standard Demijohns and a plastic water bottle at the back in case I run out of space. Notice that this isn't clear. It will clear hopefully but in the bottom there is a little bit of sediment, about one litre of sediment. It's really not a lot considering uh, what is there, but I'm hoping that it will clear once it's in secondary and I've put it somewhere cold. So let's undo one of the uh, caps on the top. So I've got my extended siphoning tube, which I'm going to struggle to see where the bottom of it goes, but I'll just have to do the best I can. Let's see what happens. So I've got my fermenting vessels on the floor. I need to use gravity as my friend to get this out. So let's do this. 
and in it goes. Now I've got a couple of filters. Notice I've got this mesh filter here and this one down in there just to keep any larger pieces of trub out. It won't stop the sediment going through. It might stop some of it, but I'm not too worried about that because it will settle in these secondary vessels. So this is now just basically playing the waiting game. So I'll come back to you shortly. It's a slightly tricky job because I need both hands for this and I'm holding a camera. I'll do what I can. Multitasking. And now into the next vessel. So I've got hands everywhere at the minute, but uh, what I'm going to do now is attempt to take one of these sanitised airlocks, put a bit of water in it, put that in the top just to keep it from oxidising. Anyway, just while uh, this is going through, to give you a kind of a, an update as to where I was with the fermentation. Like I said to you before, it was in primary for nine days. I kept the temperature in the room between 11 and 15 the entire time. I worked in a cold office uh, and it fermented like mad to start with. Um, but then, you know, it's just gone to nothing now. So this is the appropriate time to put it into secondary. Anyway, this is going to take me a little while. I'll get back to you when it's over. Nearly there. And there we go, bubbles in the siphoning tube. It's over. Take that out. That was actually knackering doing that. So can anyone suggest a good practical way of holding the siphoning tube in place on the funnel so I haven't got to be bent down holding it in place? Suggestions, comments, welcome. I'm just going to give my demijohns a little bit of a rinse in case they've got any uh, residual stickiness on the outside. Pop them to dry on this towel just here. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, here's what I've ended up with. So as you can see in the airlocks, there is a bit of positive pressure, which is a good thing. That means that any uh, headspace in the top will be expelling the oxygen and replacing it with CO2, as there is still a fractional bit of fermentation left in there and the agitation of this has probably stirred that up. The one I'm not happy with is this one. This is a lot of headspace and what I might do with this one I think is bottle it early as an experimenter but not consider this the main one. These behind are going to be the main ones. So yeah that's probably what will happen but I won't bother filming the bottling of this bit. I'll film the bottling of the main ones. So welcome to my entrance porch, a room you've not seen before. This is the coldest room that I've got in my house and this is where my beer is now going to sit for the next week or two in secondary, hopefully clearing. Here it is. So this is a north facing room and I'm going to cover these over with a blanket to stop any light issues. There shouldn't be any because I don't get any sunlight on this room. It's the coldest room in the house. It has no heating. It's currently 14.5 in here and it usually goes down a lot colder than this. So it's currently February, so I'm not expecting the temperature to get high at all in here. It should stay really cool. It's like a fridge. It feels like a fridge when you walk in here from the main part of the house. So I've got the blinds closed and I've now got this towel behind the demijohns. So the light won't be any issue whatsoever. And I want to leave them here for at least two weeks. So the next film from me in about two weeks time, we'll be bottling. Catch you then, folks. Good evening from the kitchen folks. It's my least favourite part of the entire brew process. It's big bottling day. Let's have a look at that citrus lager. So it's been in a nice cold place in secondary for 20 days. It's not clear clear but it's definitely a lot darker and you'll notice at the bottom of each of these demijohns that there is a very thin layer of sediment, probably 0.5 centimetres or something like that. I don't think it's going to get any clearer in secondary, so I'm going to bottle it. And I'm just going to accept the fact that it might not be a clear lager, but hopefully when I've left the bottles to lager, then it might become clearer. I am slightly regretting using medium spray malt, however, because I think it's too dark for a lager. But let's see anyway. 
So I've got a very productive kitchen on this extremely rainy night outside. I've got clean bottles here, clean bottles there. I've got sanitizer in there which has come out of the bottles and I'm going to reuse inside these demijohns. I've got these big demijohns up here which once they're empty I'm going to put the sanitizer in because tomorrow I've got an IPA which is going across into them. It's an hard life being a brewer. So I've got my first lot of bottles in the sink and in each bottle I need to add some priming sugar, just standard household sugar. So in each of the small bottles I'm adding one teaspoonful and in the larger bottles which are 750 ml I'm going to add a heaped teaspoonful and then just a little bit more like that. Now this will help the lager to achieve a sparkle. The yeast which is left within this will eat this sugar, it will cause a fractional fermentation, it will build up pressure and that's what will give the lager bubbles. And that's the plan anyway, fingers crossed. So that's my primary sugar now in the bottles so it's time to get my first bung out. And my sanitised siphoning tube goes in. So you'll note that the bottom of the siphoning tube is right above the sediment line. It will drop a little bit of sediment, but the first bit that comes out is going to go into the hydrometer tube. Let's crack on. And in it goes. Nice and beery smell, it's what you want when you're making beer. Right, that's coming through nicely. And it's actually a, a lot lighter colour in the tube than what it is in the Demijohn, which is slightly encouraging. And there we go, bubbles in the siphoning tube tell me that the first demijohn is now done. Okay, the first demijohn's done, I'm now on to the second one. So once again, quick suck. Oh, it tastes nice, that citrusiness, I just got that on the end of my tongue. Not wrong with that. Right, you don't need to watch all this again. You've seen it once. I'm going to come back to you when I've done this demi on. So I'll catch you in a minute. Anyway, the first two are done. I've just got a cheeky little nifter. Literally a single measure of spirits worth of it. It smells gorgeous. Citrus massively carries through with the beery smell. That is champion. That's going to be a brilliant summer drink. Excellent stuff. So here's the story so far. I'm just going to go through a little sample of the uh, capping and bunging and then I'm going to go back to the rest of the job. So I'm using three kinds of bottles. The first kind is the flip. A design classic and this literally goes on the top like that. You pull this down here, that's done. Couldn't be easier. I wish they were all like this. The second type of bottle I'm using is the classic champagne bottle which requires a bung and a cage. So I'm using bungs which I've had softening in very, very hot water, just under boiling, and that makes them malleable so they're easy to push in because otherwise they can be brittle and very difficult, leaving my delicate hands looking somewhat wounded. Anyway, once the bung's gone in, that's great, but it needs to stay in. And when the fermentation begins, the fractional fermentation from the priming sugar, it builds up pressure, that becomes a missile, so it needs holding in place with a cage. The bung itself, I've bought from Amazon, I've bought loads of these, and I've just reused them and reused them and reused them. Brilliant. These are recycled, so I get them from my wife, from my neighbours, from my local micro pub, 
Brilliant. They last about three times usually before they break. Sometimes they last a lot longer. So I'm just twisting this one in place now and I can feel that the metal on this one's getting a bit thin. It's not got a lot of life left in it, but it will do this time. So that's a bottle done. I've obviously got lots more to do, so you don't need to see me do all of those. I'm now going to show you the third kind of bottle I'm using. So the third kind of bottle I'm using is this kind and this requires a crown cap. So here's my crown cap. I literally bought like 500 of them for a couple of quid online. And this is the capper. It's not a right good capper to be honest, but it does the job for the small amount of cap bottles that I use. So you lower this down and push it into place like that. A bit like Space Invaders. So this is magnetic. The cap sits on that nice and easily, just like that. That's the easiest bit. I've got my bottle down there in the sink, so I'm pushing downwards when I'm capping, like so. So pushing downwards doesn't guarantee that the bottle won't slip, but it makes it less likely that the bottle won't slip. And this is a really nice bottle for capping. It's not uh, stuck at all, that's gone really well. And I can see I've got a good seal from the feel of that. Take a look at that. So that's a lovely seal on that. I've got other bottles to do now. I've got all these just here and I'll have plenty more. The siphoning process, the capping bunging process is exactly the same. You don't need to see it all again. So I'll come back to you when I've done the remaining stuff. Okay, I'm just about done bottling. This one isn't quite full. So what I'm gonna do is take the uh, final gravity now and I'm gonna add that into this bottle. I wouldn't normally do that, but it just seems a shame. Otherwise, I might have to drink it tonight and I don't want to do that. Oh, that sank encouragingly well. And I've finished on a final gravity of 1.008. That's 10.08. I'll work out the ABV shortly. Okay, it's rinsing time. So I've got lots of sticky bottles now and I want to rinse these off and tomorrow morning I'm going to label them when they've dried off. So I'm just going to do that, have a tidy round and then I'll be back to you. Right that's looking a bit tidier now. I've got 27 bottles. So it's time to work out the alcohol by volume. So I started off on an original gravity of 1.048 Added up from that the final gravity of 1.008, that equals 0.04. I then multiply this by 131.25 and that gives me a final alcohol by volume of 5.25%. Let's just say after the fractional fermentation that will take place in the bottle, 5.3%. And that's a nice percentage lager to enjoy on a summer's day. Right, I've done for tonight. I'm letting the bottles dry overnight and then tomorrow it's going to be labelling and putting them in for conditioning. So I'll catch you then. So it's the next morning and I've printed out my bottle labels as you can see just here. And I've just made them in a very simple Microsoft Word template. Right, it's time to label. I'm just getting the labels on the front. Let's take a little bit of pride. I know they're not the most exciting of labels, but at least I know what I've got in the bottles now. I'll come back to you when this is done. And there we go. Dreaming of hot summer days with a nice bottle of citrus lager. So bottling day, completed it mate. So welcome to the conditioning room folks. Let's have a look at the setup. So here are my citrus lagers and you can see that they're all nicely together on these shelves. I've got some other beers and ciders underneath. This top shelf is entirely the citrus lagers. And just here you can see a little metal thing. That's actually a thermometer and that is connected to a thermostat plug on the floor down there and when the temperature drops beneath 19.5 the thermostat plug is activated and when it goes above 20.5 it turns off so that keeps these at a nice temperature 
for conditioning. So I'm going to let these condition at this temperature for the next two weeks. After that, I'm then going to take them somewhere cool to lager. So I'll catch you at the next film when it comes to the lagering phase. See you then. Good evening from the kitchen, folks. Apologies for the background noise. I've got the air still going. But today, it's all about opening that lager. And here it is. Okay, it's been in the bottle for five weeks. It's conditioned for a month. And then for the last week, it's been in the fridge. I'm trying to simulate lagering. I don't know how successful I'll be. There's a lesson to be learned in this. I think in future, if I make a lager, I'll make it in autumn so it can lager over the winter somewhere cold like a garden shed and then it'll be ready for spring. Instead I've made it after Christmas and now we've got into spring it's getting warm and I've not really got anywhere to put this to lager it so it's been in the fridge for a week. Let's see if it's made any difference to it. I'm wanting something which is going to be nice and crispy, hopefully clear, definitely with a sparkle and I can see that the bung has raised about a millimetre or two so I think there probably is a sparkle on this one. I want that citrusy flavour to come through, I want it to be nice and refreshing. If I can get most of those things, I'll be a happy chappy. So I'm just taking the cage off. And now I need to remove the bone. Oh, we have a sparkle and vapour. That's a good sign. Right, let's see how it pours nice and gently in my good and carulous glass. Okay, it's nice and light. Remember I had to use the wrong spray malt because I couldn't get the right one I wanted. So it will be slightly darker than what you might expect a lager to be. Let's give it a bit of a head finish. Okay, I don't think that looks too bad actually. What do you think? Let's have a look. Right. Smells very lagery and it smells very citrusy, so that's boarding well. How does it taste? Flipping out. It's like summer's come early. That's really, really good. I'm very, very happy with that. I think given a bit longer, this will be even better. So I'm kind of hoping for a cold snap. We've just had 20 degree heat in March. Um, if we get a bit of a cold snap, then that'll be good for this if I can put it somewhere cold. But I'm going to leave it up to mature a little bit and hopefully it will be even better. But that initial first taste, flipping good. So the lesson to learn from this is make your lagers in autumn to drink them in spring and make your stouts and your porters in spring to drink them in autumn. That's what I'm going to do from now on. That's the pattern I'm going to follow interspersed of course with ciders, wines and a bit of cheeky stilling. Shh, keep that one quiet. That is so good. Anyway folks, I'm going to enjoy this, all of it. I hope you've enjoyed the film. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you already haven't and give my Facebook page for Moss Home and Garden a like. Uber appreciated. Catch you on the next brew folks. Cheers. The film that you've just watched is a Moss Home and Garden production. You can find more by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk. I'd just like to say thank you very much for supporting my YouTube channel and for watching my films. It really is very much appreciated. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to receive future updates about the Home and Garden films which I upload. You can find my YouTube channel by going to www.mosshomeandgarden.co.uk Please click on the red subscribe button. When you've done that, a little bell will appear. If you press that also, then you'll get future updates about the films which I upload. If you like my films, if you like my style of filming, then you might also like my travel channel, which you will find by going to youtube.com forward slash Stuart Moss or type in www.mosstravel.tv Again, if you could subscribe to that channel, it would be hugely appreciated. If you'd like to get Moss Home and Garden updates on Facebook, then please open Facebook and do a search for Moss Home and Garden and you will find the page. If you like the page, then you will get future updates on there. 
and if you'd like to connect on Instagram for home, garden and travel photography as well as some stories then my username is Stu Moss, S-T-U-M-O-S-S. -S. If you'd like to connect on Twitter then my username is at Stuart Moss and if you'd like to contact me about film usage or any other issue please just email me on stewmosshomegarden at gmail.com once again, thank you very much for supporting my channel, for watching my films. I do appreciate it. I'd just like you all to have a great day.